here in our student welfare success department. I want to say good evening to everybody. And thank you for coming out. We're going to start here in a couple of minutes, as Lily and Elise were saying. But we want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. We started what we used to call Parent University last year. And this was actually started by our social work group, our SEL team, our social emotional learning team. About five years ago, we brought our first social worker in the district. And around three years ago, after the LCAP survey, uh, our community members said that our kids need greater social emotional support within the district. And so we hired 14 social workers and brought them on board and they've been a tremendous asset to us. And it's one of those, they perform a function for us that we couldn't imagine not having them now in our school district. They are so critical supporting the social and emotional needs of not only our students, but sometimes our staff as well. And this year we're calling what used to be parent university is family university because we want to support all the families in our district. And we're trying to do these about twice a month. And we're trying to offer something that is going to be a benefit to everyone. And we did this one last year. We had such a large turnout, even when we did it live, that we wanted to offer it again because it's a very important topic. And it's when we want to, we want to make sure that we get that message out there about um, what families can do during this time to be aware of all this. So I'm going to let Lily and Elise present on that. But thank you for coming out tonight. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. They did mention that Amy is on here, one of our other social workers, and she's going to be gathering your questions. And I think the idea is going to be to try to answer all your questions at the end of the presentation this evening. So um, put them in there. Please don't give any identifying information in terms of uh, like your child's name or anything like that. So you know, please keep it generic, but um, feel free to ask away and we want to be here to support you. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Lillian and Elise. Hey, thank you, Jess. <laughs> All right. Okay. The next slide, Lily. Yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. So my name's Elise. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker and I support Chaparral High School. And I'm Lily Nunez and I'm the licensed clinical social worker at Temecula Valley High School. Okay, so our objectives today and our, like our goals today um, is to first teach you some relevant statistics. So kind of really give you an idea of like what's going on um, nowadays regarding suicide. Um, and then we're going to talk about relative terminology. So some terms um, regarding suicide again, but um, we'll be using some of that terminology. So we wanted to give you some definitions. Um, and then a big part of our um, presentation will be identifying warning signs risk factors and protective factors. So that's gonna be a bulk of it. And then we're gonna move into how to have a conversation. So how to have this type of conversation about suicide with someone and then kind of how to respond. Um, and then we'll give you a little bit of um, info about how um, our district deals with a suicide concern. Um, and then we're gonna end with some resources for you guys. So. All right, so just some quick housekeeping things here. Um, obviously, we'd love to see your faces, but if you're not comfortable leaving your camera on, that's totally okay, too. Um, I think we've all at this point in during COVID have been to those presentations where we like to have our camera off, and that's totally fine. Um, if you can, please keep yourself muted unless you're talking. And then if you have any general questions, go ahead and just put it into the chat box. Um, and I'm just going to reiterate this, um, especially on a topic like this, we just want to make sure that there's no identifying information. So if you have a very specific question about like your student or somebody else, we just ask that you follow um, our protocol, which is to reach out to, if it's an elementary school student, to the site social worker, and if it's middle school or high school, to reach out to the student's assigned counselor. Um, typically, if we were in an in-person presentation, you know, we'd be able to stay after and kind of hang back and answer some of those questions or talk to you a little bit about that. But in this kind of setting, it's just too difficult with confidentiality. So we wanna make sure we connect you to the right people. Um, at the end of the presentation, we're going to give you guys a copy of all the slides that if you wanted to print out. So if you've got notes you're taking somewhere, um, feel free, but don't feel like you have to write down what's on the slides because we'll give you that. And then also we're going to record this and it'll be available later. And then the last thing, we know that this is like a really heavy topic. It's not always easy to talk about these things, especially if it's hitting close to home for some of you. Um, so feel free to take a break or step aside or leave completely if that's what you need to do. So whatever works for you works for us. All right. 
So I love like when I go into presentations and people start off with like a story or a way to connect um, that really helps me feel like engaged with not just the presenters, but the entire presentation. So if you haven't seen this video, um, I love it and I'll explain a little bit why, um, but it's all about our why and knowing our why and why that's important. And I can say why a lot. So I think that. Oh, Lily, you have to hit play on your end, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. I was waiting for you. <laughs> sorry. No sound. Sorry. Okay. Maybe Amy or Donna, if you have a quick fix, if you know how to fix the volume. It's on her toggle. It's all the way up. Okay. Make sure that you've got sound on your computer, like on your, that you've got it hooked to. to do you have your headphones? Do you have headphones or anything hooked in there? No, I don't. Can you still um, not hear it? Just so you know, for Please. like when I use Zoom, it, if you go to the top, if you bring the it to the top, it'll something usually comes down and then you can pick select and it'll say put computer sound on. Yes. Okay, let's see. Because it's on your screen, so I can't do it for you. It's like it's like at the top, towards the top, like right, not the right corner, but top right. Sometimes it doesn't come down though. Maybe audio setting. Yeah, there's an audio setting, but if you like, it's hidden right now. But if you go to the top right, it might pop up, and then you can select the sound. You might have to get at a full screen, Lily. Okay. Hey everyone, bear with us. Yeah, sorry. Oh man, now I'm stuck in the full screen. Well, why don't you? I pulled up YouTube if you want me. Um, I can try to see if I can screen share just the YouTube the channel. Video. Lily, hit your, if you can't get a full screen, just hit your escape button. There's a there's this thing that says more on the right bottom towards okay. the bottom right. Try that one. Oh, share computer sound. Let me yep. see. Yeah. Shout out to you. How do I know? A lot of people, when they think of the phrase, how do I know, they always want to put the what behind it. How do I know what I'm supposed to do? The, the question that you really should ask is, how do I know why I'm here? Because when you know your why, your what becomes more clear and more impactful. If you know, like for instance, um, people know that I do comedy, but that's what I do. My why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. So I can do comedy, I can write books, I can be in a movie, because all of it is motivated by my why. In fact, I have a new, uh, a new web series out called Michael Jr. Break Time. Uh, we probably just did the sixth episode, it's on YouTube. So every single Wednesday at three o'clock, we drop a new episode on YouTube of Michael Jr. Break Time. What it is, is it's me, I travel around the country and I do stand-up comedy, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and in the middle of my comedy set sometime, I'll stop and just talk to my audience. And we've been filming this and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. So <laughs> we're in Winston-Salem. I'm gonna show you a clip from Winston-Salem. And I'm just talking to this guy in the audience and he tells me that he's a, uh, a musical instructor at a school. So I was like, all right, you're a musical instructor. You know, can you sing? Let me hear you sing a song. So this is what happened at the last episode of Michael Jr.'s Break Time. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of like uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Go ahead. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. Wow. That brought a sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, now, once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet. 
sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Okay, um, here's what I want you to catch. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what becomes more impactful because you're walking towards or in your purpose. All right. I watched that in the training. I just love that. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, where I really want to go with that is just for you guys to take a second to think about why you're here. Um, whether that's somebody that you know, that's, you know, died by suicide or somebody that you know, that struggled with suicidal thoughts before, whatever it is, or you just want to learn more. I just want you to think about your why for a second. And Lily and I, when we were making this presentation, we talked about, you know, sharing our why. And I think it's important because it's a big part of, you know, who we are and why we're in this field too. So, so for me, um, I lost my mom to suicide when I was a kid. And so that kind of put me on this track of wanting to get into this field and to help other people. And it's just a really, really important topic to me and to help others kind of connect and understand it and learn more about it so that we can hopefully help prevent more suicides, um, especially with everything going on in the world right now. So that's my why. And yeah, I'll share my why also. Um, so when I, I'm going to start with my first why and then I'll, it's morphed a little bit. Um, but my initial why um, to help others and be a therapist was um, I moved a lot when I was little and I didn't have uh, my father in my life. So I had a lot of different father figures growing up. Um, and so we moved a lot, different, always changing. So my environment was just like really unstable. Um, and I didn't have anyone to talk to. Uh, my mom um, wasn't a talker. <laughs> um, so I felt like I internalized a lot of that. So the reason why I became a therapist is to be that for someone else, like just to be that safe person. Um, that, you know, that comforting person that I always wanted. Um, and then as we got into the field or as I started working in the field, um, I really was a part of um, a lot of devastating um, suicide stories. Um, and it just really put a passion under like in me to like stop that and prevent that as much as I can. Um, so I was really exposed to a lot of it. And a big portion of our job is talking about suicide with students. And so um, that's a big why. And then just this past summer, so a few months ago, um, one of my stepfathers um, actually died by suicide. So he wasn't in my life anymore, um, and I didn't have like a relationship with him, um, but he died by suicide. And when someone close to you dies by suicide, I think it really changes your perspective about it. And so my initial first thought was, oh, like what? what I wish I could have said something to him or I wish I could have tried to stop or like what if I would have been able to talk with him or what if I would have noticed some of those warning signs so like that what if question popped up a lot so now like my why is to really help people um feel comfortable talking about that and asking those hard questions so that you don't experience what that feels like the what if question so that's my why now um, yeah, so um, we thought it would be a cool opportunity just to hear a little bit about what your guys' why is, like why are you here at this presentation, why do you want to learn more about this, so we thought maybe just briefly um, type in the chat, like a brief sentence of what your why is, like why you're here, or it could be like a person, maybe like just a name, um, yeah, just to kind of get a feel, if you feel comfortable, so we'll go ahead, if you guys do feel comfortable, go ahead and do that now, um, and then we'll kind of look at it and get a feel for everyone's why. And we'll just read a couple and maybe everyone can just look at the chat box and see what comes up. Um, yeah, so what is your why? Yep. 
Okay, so we have a parent here. Yeah, I don't know if you guys see that one, but a parent here that has a student who's experiencing depression. Two nephews. Yeah, it's so good. And normally something that we did last year when we, you know, while you guys are filling this out, um, we asked that question in a way of, you know, for anybody that's been affected by suicide in some way, basically raise your hand. And it's really neat to see that even on this end of it, you're not alone. There's so many of us that have experienced this in some capacity or another. And so it's really nice to be able to look around a room and see pretty much everybody's hand is raised. Yep, the impact of COVID. Yeah, that's a big one right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we have a couple a couple parents here that their kid is experiencing depression or anxiety. Mm -hmm. Self-harm, self-injury. We're gonna touch on that a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And thank you for those of you that are sharing. And, and for those of you that are not, that's okay. Um, you know, just take a minute and that's, we just really wanted to start off with, for you guys to reflect back on why you're here for yourself. Um, but we appreciate you being here and hope that this is helpful to help address some of those concerns and some of those whys for you. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on. Um, so this, uh, this, this is where we talk about some of the terminology and give you some definitions. Um, so we're gonna use some of these in our presentation. So we wanted to give you some um, what they mean and so you can understand. Um, so the first one is suicidal ideation. That's just like the broad term um, of, or like a, I guess, scientific term for just suicidal thoughts. So someone who's experiencing thoughts that are suicide related. Um, suicide attempt, that one's pretty self-explanatory, but a potential self-injurious behavior with a non-fatal outcome um, for which there is evidence that a person intended to kill himself or herself. So suicide attempt. Um, suicide completion, so we added this one in here because usually in the past, the broad term has been commit suicide or committed suicide. Um, so in an effort to rid the stigma um, and negative connotation that's associated with the word commit, so, um, you know, like they did something wrong, commit. Um, the mental health community has moved toward using a, the phrase complete suicide um, or died by suicide. Um, so again, yeah, we just want to move away from commit suicide to died by suicide. Um, and the next three terms, intent, means, and method, um, those are terms that are used to identify someone's risk level um, when it comes to suicide, someone who's experiencing suicide. So we just wanted to explain it. Um, they are a little technical, but um, we just, uh, this is what a, a, like a professional would use to gauge. So um, intent is the aim, purpose, or goal of the behavior. So for example, someone could have suicidal thoughts, but their intent is not to actually die. So that's why it's important to understand the intent behind it. Um, or someone could be engaging in self-harm um, and their intent is not to die. So their aim, their purpose, their reason behind it is not to die. It could be for various other reasons. Um, so intent's important when we're gauging the risk level. Um, and then means is just the instrument or object that they use. So it could be like firearm, poison, medication. Um, method is the action or technique. So overdose, jumping, suffocation, again, these are just examples. Um, and then self-harm or self-injury, um, the definition of that is ver the various methods by which individuals injure themselves, such as self-laceration, self-battering, exhibiting deliberate recklessness. So um, we just thought that would be really important to include in there because, again, self-harm, when someone's engaging in those behaviors, it doesn't necessarily mean um, that they have the intent to die, right? Um, so that's why sometimes it could be a little confusing. So self-harm is different than suicidal thoughts. And um, Elise will talk about that a little bit more um, in later slides. So. Also too, I don't know if we mentioned this, but we are gonna give you the slides. So you don't have to write all of this down. I know it's a lot of information. Um, you will have this information, so. Yeah, and I'm just gonna piggy off that and say, like there's a lot of our slides that we know are really wordy. And I don't, ideally that's not how we wanna do slides in a presentation, but I think that there's so much that unless you're really in this field, it's hard to know a lot of this. And so we want to really put as much on there so that when you do take this, that you have it. Um, and to piggyback on something that Lily had talked about, she mentioned intent. And I think that that's so important that we understand, um, especially when we're talking about this, is 
it's really just figuring out what the goal is behind it, right? So a lot of people will have these very intrusive suicidal thoughts, um, but they, they're never wanting to die. They just can't help these thoughts that come into their mind. And so that's one that we didn't put on there, but intrusive suicidal thoughts is something that's very well known in this. Okay, go ahead, Lily. Yeah. So I'm just gonna go over a little bit of the data. Um, so suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the US for all ages, and then the second leading cause of death in the US for ages 10 to 24. And I believe maybe Amy or Lily, if you can piggy on this, it used to be the third, and within the last few years, it moved to the second. Yep, yeah. Um, and so for every 25 attempts, there's a suicide completion, meaning somebody died by suicide. And then this was an, a very interesting statistic from um, Riverside County that we just got since during COVID. So from January 2020 to June 2020, 63% of the suicide attempts have been among female youth. So those are our kids. These are the kids in our district and mm -hmm. the population. And then since 2010, so in the last you know, 10 years, it's increased, youth suicide has increased 56%. And one thing I really wanted to touch on on this is when we're talking about this stuff, it, it can seem very much like, like it's normal or common. And I, and I wanna draw out that yes, people are not alone. We understand that a lot of people do experience this, but I want to differentiate that from being a normal response, right? So when I have a bad day, I don't go home and I'm not thinking of dying by suicide. I don't have suicidal thoughts. And so when people are struggling with that, that's something that we want to make sure that we're taking really seriously because it's not a normal response to adversity, to, to anything that's difficult for us. We want to make sure that when these things come up that we're addressing it. Okay, and then this slide is just a little bit more information about suicide, so I'll just read these really quickly, but um, sim simply talking about suicide will not put the idea in a person's head. So I think that in the past, we think like talking about it will um, make them think about it more, but that's been shown not to be the case. So just talking about it actually does the opposite. Um, so suicide, and the other point is suicide is not the result of one event, um, it's not. So it's, it's multiple events usually. Um, and then stressors paired with mental health illnesses. So if someone experiencing a lot of high stress and mental health um, issues can lead them to suicidal thoughts. So they're at a higher risk. Um, and then oftentimes students will display warning signs or be exposed to risk factors that increase the likelihood of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. So basically, if someone is experiencing suicidal thoughts, um, they're most likely going to be exhibiting warning signs, which is a good thing because then we'll be able to see it and they'll have some risk factors. Um, and then understanding and recognizing risk factors and warning signs are really crucial in helping identify students who are at risk um, and in providing suicide prevention strategies. So one, to gauge like where they're at, but also um, to prevent and provide the right support. And we're gonna define what all of those things mean. So Lily mentioned warning signs, risk factors, protective factors. We're gonna explain what that stuff means. And again, it's all on here too. Um, but the biggest differentiation I want to make sure you guys understand is the difference between warning signs and risk factors. So warning signs are signs that may indicate someone is at risk for suicide and may need immediate help. So these are the ones that are pretty classic that you want to make sure we're taking seriously. And so I'm, there's obviously a big list on the next three slides that you're going to see. And like we said, you're going to have a copy of this at the end. Um, but I'm going to go through a few of the main ones. So talking about wanting to die, um, wishing they weren't here anymore expressions of hopelessness, which might sound like, you know, it's not very often that somebody's going to come to you and say, I'm feeling hopeless. They're more likely to say something like, what's the point of living? What's the point of living? We're all going to die anyways. Um, talking about being a burden, which again, very rarely is somebody going to come up to you and say like, oh, I'm feeling like a burden. It might sound something more like, um, I can't do anything right. All I do is upset you. Uh, withdrawing, writings, drawings, photos, implying suicide or death. So we see a lot of that kind of stuff on social media. Um, a lot of the way this comes to our attention in the schools, right, is like through writing. So like English teachers sometimes will report different things that are coming up in students' writing. And then I wanted to touch a little bit too, like Lily had said about self-injury. So self-injury is self-harm. You know, I will say, I'm just gonna talk about the generic of like cutting. That's what typically most people know when we talk about those things. And the biggest difference is the intent. And I know Lily mentioned this, but it, it's essentially, is the intent to die by suicide or is the intent to cope? And oftentimes, especially with the population that I think we work with, we see that the intention is to cope. So sometimes when parents find out their students cutting, like everybody gets really worried and absolutely you should, um, but just understand that there's more to it than just thinking that 
you know, your student just had an attempt. Um, so it's really understanding, again, are they trying to cope with something or are they trying to die by suicide? And then in addition to that, it's important really for you to understand if they are cutting, where are they cutting? What does that look like? How deep are they cutting? What's the method in which they're doing it? So I have had some students where it's very methodical. Um, they take out their blade, they clean it, they make their cuts. And then you have other people who are doing it very like haphazardly, like without really any thought. That's where it can get really dangerous. Um, so it's really just trying to gather as much information and get, get curious about it. And then I think that's it on mine, Lily, go ahead. Okay, yeah, so risk factors. Risk factors do not cause or predict suicide. So it's really important to understand that. It doesn't cause or predict. Rather, they are characteristics that increase the likelihood that an individual will, will consider, attempt, or die by suicide. So the way that I like to think of these are like predisposed variables. So like what they're born with. Um, or And also I like to think of it as like more internal. A lot of these are internal. A lot of it's out of their control. Um, I feel like warning factors are, um, are like, external, like you can see them, you can visibly notice them. Um, so again, I'm not going to talk about all of them because there's a lot. I'll just talk about a few. Um, but I think alcohol and substance abuse is a big one. Um, I think there's an article I read once that um, most teenagers who attempt suicide are under the influence, um, which kind of makes sense. Your, your inhibitions are down. Um, you know, you're not thinking clearly, you're maybe a little bit more impulsive. So if someone struggles, a teen or a youth or anything struggles with alcohol or substance use, it does put them at that higher risk. Um, hopelessness, like Elise mentioned. So again, this is that negative thinking about life that like, like nothing's ever going to work out for me, like that type of thinking. So it's that mindset about life. Um, the other one I'm going to mention is a previous suicide attempt or family and family history of suicide. So um, if a student has previously attempted and um, or they know family members that have attempted, it really does put them at a higher risk to try again or um, follow in suit. Um, the other one I want to kind of mention is loss of relationship. Um, and the reason why I wanted to talk about this is I feel like a lot of adults kind of like brush over this one. Oh, whatever, like they just got, you know, broken up with. Um, but if we think about developmentally at this age, you know, middle school through high school, um, developmentally, the most important thing is to connect with your peers. Um, and it is to have that first intimate relationship. Um, so if a student really, um, you know, loses that and experiences a great loss, it could put them in a crisis. So it could put them at that higher risk. Um, the other one I want to talk about is access to lethal means. So there's a lot of research that shows just having easy access to a dangerous object will put them at a higher risk. So, um, which kind of makes sense. If I don't have to think about how I'm going to get that object, I will most like, you know, if I'm being impulsive, I will have it right there. Um, so for example, guns, if they're not in a safe or anything like that, automatically puts them at a higher risk for suicide. Um, lack of social support and sense of isolation. I would say this is probably the most common that I see. Um, so when I do suicide um, uh, assessments, um, I see, I feel like I hear this one very often. I feel alone. No one cares about me. So that feeling of isolation, I think is a big one. I think it kind of goes back to that developmental stage, like not having that peer support could be really crucial um, to a youth. Um, and then, um, let's see. And then the last one is just, I wanted to touch on the vulnerable population. So if a youth is in the LGBT community, um, is in foster youth or has been in foster youth or has experienced um, bullying or abuse, and abuse can be um, any type of abuse, um, it, it does put them at a higher risk for suicide. Um, so again, you guys will have this, you guys can refer to this and read, read it in more depth. Um, is there anything else, Elise, that I missed that you want to no. add? Okay, uh -huh. so we'll go to the next slide. And we'll have questions actually after the next slide for you guys. Yeah, we're going to pause just to see if there's any questions that you have in a second. Okay, so protective factors um, are basically characteristics that make a person less likely to engage in suicidal behavior, um, even though they don't always counteract um, like a suicidal attempt or suicidal ideation, they do promote resiliency, which is essentially right that ability to like adapt well despite adversity, despite trauma, anything like that, um, or when you're dealing with any kind of significant stress. So this can be really beneficial in the process of safety planning. And again, safety planning is, is a term that we use basically when a person is suicidal and able to plan to keep themselves safe. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about that. And we have a great app to recommend for that. Um, 
So the more protective factors somebody has, the more likely they are to be able to safety plan and commit to that safety. So I'm just gonna, again, mention a few of these. So strong connections to family and community support, skills in problem solving and conflict resolution, access to medical and mental health support, feelings of success and achievement, positive self-esteem. And so the reason I'm focusing on a lot of this is I think sometimes in a way, like we don't give enough credit to some of those things being like strong supports for mental health. So when we talk about mental health and supporting somebody's mental health, we often just think of like therapy and, and like interventions, but all of this stuff is an intervention. You sitting down with your kids and having dinner and talking to them and really getting to know them is an intervention. This is stuff that really helps to promote the like resiliency and really connects them. Um, we're not here to talk about substance use, but knowing that a lot of you here probably have uh, teens, I will say, you know, it's a big, there's a lot of research that shows the more families sit down and have dinner together, the less likely they are to engage in dangerous behaviors, including substance abuse. Um, so all of this is just super connected. And so I think that's it for here. We're gonna take a pause for a second because I know we kind of threw a lot of information at you guys. Does anybody have any questions? Um, if you wanna put it into the chat and we're gonna just take a couple minutes to answer some of those. Give it a couple minutes. Yeah, the protective factors are the good news. That's like what can help. And it's like, I love looking at these because like, there's actually stuff that you can do <laughs> to help prevent it, which is nice. Other yeah. than the professional. We a lot too about like trauma and all these different things that are a huge risk factor, but resiliency and all those things kind of counteract that. So it can be really helpful. Okay. I'm not seeing any questions come through. So if something comes up, we'll take a pause. Oh, there we go. Turn the camera for the day is gaslighting. Make sure it's right to it. Oh, I feel like I'm not the best. Ex I feel like if Amy, Amy, if you're there, I feel like you'd be really good at explaining gaslighting, not to put you on the spot. Um, but no, gaslighting is not really a term used for suicide. But Amy, are you comfortable explaining a little more? A little bit. Okay. So, <laughs> so Thank usually you. when when people bring up the term gaslighting, it's to put it like very simply, it's very much like making the other person feel like they're crazy. Um, and I say crazy in quotes because we already, as, um, as a mental health professional, I, I have an issue with that word. But basically, um, it comes with like the idea of like when somebody brings forward a concern um, that the other person turns it around and somehow makes it about like them and like sort of blaming the other person. Um, and when talking about like mental health and, and how gaslighting can be something that could come up, um, I would think for somebody who may have like suicidal ideation, um, some of it could be like feelings like there may be, um, like that they could be the burden or, or they could be burdening somebody with like bringing up constant thoughts and stuff like that. And so maybe that's, I don't know if that's like specific to how that term was brought up with, within your situation, but. I don't know if that answers the question. Thanks, yeah. Amy. Yeah, yeah, that was helpful. Thank you. Yeah. That's like a big um, word right now. Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions? If you think about it, you can always add them and we'll come back to them. And we're going to pause a couple times throughout and then at the end um, have room for questions too. Okay. So we'll go ahead and move on. Okay, so now we're going to move into giving you guys tips on actually how to start a conversation. So again, giving you these tools, making you feel comfortable um, if you were to talk to someone about suicide. Um, so um, we just have a couple tips for you and then we have some examples for you. Um, okay, so before starting, it's really important to prepare yourself with resources. Um, so having something on hand, having a phone number, having a place to go is really important. Um, also, finding a safe and private place to talk with a person. Um, this sounds self-explanatory, but it really is a big one. Um, if you're in a situation or an environment where you think someone can overhear you or someone's going to walk in, um, it might not, you might not get the real genuine answer. Um, so if you were going to talk to your child about it, I would find a very private place. And also to um, maybe not on the way to something, like on the way to school or on the way to practice, even though you're pr it's private, um, they might not indulge and be honest, obviously, because they might have to leave and you know, and you don't want that to happen either, because um, what if they did share something and then they left, right? 
Um, okay, so another tip is just constantly throughout the conversation, just expressing your concern and your support. Um, it does such a big difference when you're talking to someone, if you constantly reassure them that you're there for them, um, you really get a lot out. And like, we do this all the time and uh, we do see it happen and it really works. Um, talk openly and honestly. Um, this is a really good one when you're starting the conversation. So mention the reason why you're asking. I think it brings down that level of anxiety, like that level of defensiveness, like try and gauge why you're asking me. Um, so just being upfront and asking, like telling them why you're asking is huge. Um, also too, you could start with um, maybe talking about the warning sign that you've noticed um, and just being open about it. Like, hey, I learned this about, um, or I, I learned this in a training and, you know, I noticed that you do this and this and this. Like that would be great and honest and open. Um, and I think you can get a really good answer from that, a genuine answer. Um, and also a good point is ask directly. So I think this one's really hard um, sometimes for people who aren't in this field because um, asking the question, are you thinking about suicide can sound really intense to actually do it. But um, if you do that, you get your, and you're very clear and direct, you get that clear and direct answer back. Um, if you kind of beat around the bush, it, again, it can raise that anxiety. You could, you could get like an unclear answer. So I know sometimes, you know, people say, oh, are you going to hurt yourself? Like, that's really ambiguous. It's not clear. You don't know what we don't, the student might not know what you're asking. Um, so asking very directly. So these are examples. Um, you can also ask, are you thinking about ending your life? Um, have you ever thought about suicide before? That's one that I probably use the most. Um, it kind of gets, it's a less direct, um, not direct, it's less confrontational and it's kind of a little safer. Like, oh yeah, I used to do that last year. I used to think about it last year. It's easier for um, maybe a student to admit that. And then again, it leads the conversation. You can ask a little bit more and then they eventually end up telling you. That's just what I've seen, um, but I use that one often. I'm just gonna piggy off that real quick, Lily. Yeah. Um, cause we hear this a lot too, that like Lily said, sometimes people will say like, well, why can't I ask, are you thinking of hurting yourself? So even your younger ones, right? So for those of you that are here that maybe have elementary school students, it's still really important that we make that differentiation because somebody that has intentions to die, if you ask them, are you having thoughts of wanting to hurt yourself? They may be like, no, cause they're not thinking of hurting themselves. They're thinking of wanting to die. And yeah. so it can feel very like, what? That's a really like hard thing to, to ask, like Lily said. But it's really important to get the to get to the right answer. You have to ask the right question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, and then I'll go ahead and do this um, slide also. Um, so let's say you do ask that question. You're you know you're brave enough and you ask that direct question, but their answer is not direct. So they give you a kind of unclear answer. These are just some tactics of how to get more information out of them. So. Um, Firstly, validating what they shared um, is a really good way to get more information out of them. Again, making them feel safe, comfortable, expressing your concerns. So saying something like, I'm here, I'm hearing you say that you don't really know. Um, I'm here for you though, and we'll listen without judging. Um, so again, safe place, not judging, and makes them feel really like they can't open up. Um, another a good suggestion is try to gather more information. So maybe take the pressure off of them answering that question and maybe you can ask more about their warning signs that you've noticed. So maybe dive into that a little bit more. Um, again, it could get them talking a little bit more and you could get the answer eventually. Um, Another one is explore their reasons for both living and dying. So talking in a general sense, like, hey, what are your reasons for living? What are some reasons that are hard for living or for wanting to die? Like, what do you think they are? Um, so again, it kind of takes that pressure off of how they're feeling exactly, and you can talk more in a general sense. Um, we put this one here, highlight the li the, that living is an option. Um, because a lot of times students that are experiencing suicidal thoughts have a very like tunnel vision, like dying is the only option. So highlighting that living is an option is good, but with caution, like you don't want to say that too early on in the conversation because it might shut them down. It might um, defer them from opening because they might feel like you're trying to convince them otherwise, which eventually you want to do, but you want to do it um, when they trust you and they, you know, the conversation's going. Um, and then uh, again, the big one is just to establish safety. So if they still aren't unclear, you want to discuss maybe a plan for what to do um, and who to talk to if they ever feel that way in the future. So that's a really good one um, to remember and to, to always include. Um, it's kind of like, you know, a fire escape plan. Like we all know what to do um, if there's a fire. So same thing. We want to really establish that plan if they ever feel that way. Um, and then if you are having this conversation, they might be struggling in some areas. So maybe offering professional help just in general, like, do you want to see a therapist? Do you want to talk to your counselor? Um, that's a really good place to go also. 
Um, is there anything else, Elise, that you would add? Mm -mm. Okay. Cool. And then now Elise is going to do the harder one. <laughs> yeah. So again, I know this is a little bit wordy, and and I just want to preface this with like we're we're speaking in very like in a way kind of gray terms. Every situation is going to be different. So this is kind of like a guideline on what to do. Um, at the end of the day, safety first. So if you're if you get to the point with this conversation where you're like, oh my gosh, I don't even know what to do. I don't remember anything. Then just call a hotline, and we'll talk about different things that you can do. But just remember safety first. So so let's say you had this conversation, right? You asked your student, um, they said yes. So now you're like, okay, so what do I do with this? Yes, how do I respond? So the first thing you're gonna support, empathize with them, validate throughout the process, try not to do anything judgmental. And really you wanna do this in a way that's not agreeing with them that suicide is the answer, right? So sometimes when we think that we're validating feelings, we feel like we have to like be agreeable. Um, we don't, so we can still validate by saying something like, thank you for telling me that must've been really, really hard for you to share. I can't imagine how much pain you've been in. I really care about you and I'm here to listen and help. And this is, I imagine for some of you, maybe not the exact way you'd say it. And that's fine. Like you say it from a place of how it would feel for you, but still come across with that empathy, with the validation. So the next thing you're going to want to do is if you're comfortable, ask if they have a plan. And so. If you're not comfortable getting to this point, this is where I would say stop and just let them know like, hey, I, you know, I validated how they feel. I really don't know what to do to help at this point. So I think the next step I'm gonna take is really try to get you to talk to somebody that, that is able to have this conversation. If you are comfortable, then you can go in and ask, hey, have you had thoughts about how, like how you would end your life? Like, have you had any of those considerations before? And see what they say. So then the next thing, if they do indicate that they have a plan, you're gonna wanna gauge them on a scale. This is a great way to say, hey, like on a scale of one to 10, 10 being likely, one being not likely, how likely are you to act on the plan? Because then you can really gauge the intention, right? So going back to when we talked about the terms, we're talking about intent, we're talking about means, we're trying to see where they're at with this. And this is all the kind of stuff too, and Lily will talk about this in a little bit, that we do in our offices on, on the level that somebody's at. So again, just the answer, yes, somebody may have suicidal thoughts, but have never considered a plan, may never have any intention to follow through, or they may be on that end. So think of it like a spectrum. So yes, is a spectrum and we're trying to figure out where they're at on it. So then the next thing you're gonna do is establish safety. So anytime somebody says yes or feeling suicidal, don't leave them alone. We do this in our offices. So if we're, we're talking to a student that's suicidal, that's like the first thing, you don't leave them alone. Um, so if you need to make a phone call, you need to step away, they come with you, you stay there. And then you're going to want to consider the level of risk to determine the next appropriate response. And we're going to go over that in a minute, in a little bit with um, kind of some guidelines on like the level of risk and then what to do. Um, it's really important in this situation too to not try to fix their feelings or fix what's going on or change how they're feeling. Um, I know it can be, I actually don't know. I've never been in this situation with my own kids. I cannot imagine being in this situation with my own kids and and feeling like all you wanna do is help take that away from them, like help take away their pain, help take away that feeling. Um, but it's really important just to, just to sit in it with them for a minute and really try to help get them to the place that they need to be. And so if they have said yes, and you do, especially like Lily said, you know, if you have access to the different types of means, especially firearms, um, pills, that kind of stuff, you're gonna to wanna to lock that up. Um, for a lot of parents that I've talked to who have students that this is pretty regular for them, for their student to feel this way. It's, it's just how they function. Their kitchen knives are locked up, their pills are locked up, um, everything. And I've, I've heard some parents even say like, well, I ha all I have is Tylenol. Well, Tylenol can be used to overdose at a certain level, right? So we still, even the over-the-counter stuff, we still wanna make sure that we're keeping that stuff inaccessible. And then if appropriate, um, so let's say your student says, yes, I'm feeling, you know, I've had suicidal thoughts before. No, I don't have a plan. Um, I'm not really thinking that far. You can create a safety plan with them. So again, the safety plan is a way for them to really help them, them identify and help you understand like what are the triggers that get them to the point where they're maybe feeling this way? What are some of the distractions that can help them? What do they do when they're having these thoughts? Who do they talk to? And it really kind of goes down this list of like, I would say in a way like least restrictive to more restrictive. So kind of helps them to understand, oh, okay, I can talk to these people. I can, I know getting outside distracts me from that thought for a little bit. And so there's a great app called My3. And the safety plan used with that app is actually something that we all use to safety plan in our offices. And so it's a really great app 
because then you get to see kind of like what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and then I think just another great little tidbit for this is our feelings are so, they go like waves, right? So reassuring them that they're not going to feel like this forever, making sure that they know that they're not alone um, and really trying to partner with them. So if they're in a very like, you know, they're telling you this and it's not like an urgent thing where they're trying to like run away and hurt themselves in that moment, um, really try to partner with them on establishing that safety. Lily, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I think I would just add on the, I know we keep mentioning like being supportive and being emp like empathizing and stuff. Um, and I know that like, I feel like we're saying that a lot, but the reason I, I've literally heard students say like, oh, well, I'm, my mom freaked out. She got like, she was crying and she got really upset or, you know, my parents, like, I think I made them mad. Um, not knowing how you like parents react can really defer them and they'll say things like, oh, I'll never tell them again. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we like talk about it so much. So like staying calm, not reacting, not necessarily saying your opinion, but just supporting them and showing empathy is um, actually a future benefit because they're more likely to come to you again. Um, so that's why we keep saying that, like uh, empathizing is huge. Um, so I would just add that piece. Um, I would agree. Yeah, I hear yeah. that a lot from students. They just, yeah. And I think sometimes too, in the other end of, they just don't want to, they don't want to worry you, right? Yeah. Like it's yeah. different coming in and telling us they don't know yeah. us like they know you. We're not in that type of, we don't have that relationship with them. Um, yeah. So it's really important to really try to come at this like as calm as possible. Like you may be feeling like you just want to cry and get this out. Yeah. Like if you can just hold that in for a little bit to get through these conversations and then yeah. go after safety is established, like go call your friend, go talk to your partner, whoever it is, just to like help you work through that. Cause that is, it's, it's gotta be difficult. Yeah. I mean, even for us, like when we're in session, I still even get like emotional when I hear students like talk about it, but I, I know it's going to benefit them if I don't react yeah. um, because they're more likely to come to me again. And that, that's what I want. I want that openness, that safe place. So, okay. Which leads us into, we told you a lot about what to say so we're going to talk a little bit about what to what not to say or do um and it may feel kind of silly so some of you may be looking like what why do we have to of course i wouldn't say or do these things but these things happen and we hear this especially from students yeah um so it is it's so uncomfortable to have these conversations right so we want to make sure that we're not asking kids in a way that you're basically looking for a no so if i go to johnny and i'm like johnny you're not thinking about suicide are you johnny's gonna be like well no like my mom or dad or whoever just clearly asked me in a way that they don't want me to answer, right? And that's more of us trying to protect, I think, ourselves and it is really trying to get to the root of what they're really feeling. So you wanna make sure that you're asking direct. Um, you also wanna make sure that you ask, you do not ask them in a way that makes them feel like they cannot say yes. And so, are you thinking about suicide? Oh my gosh, I don't know what I would do without you. And while I think that they need to hear that, I don't know what I would do without you. I love you. I want you to be here. All those things. I think that there's a place for that in this conversation and it's not in that question. So when you're asking, are you thinking about suicide? Are you thinking about wanting to die? Have you had those thoughts? That question really needs to stand alone. It needs to be by itself, pause and get an answer. And I think that you will be a lot more intuitive in those moments when you're having that conversation, because when you ask that question and you see them, right? Pause, not answer, no. And you hear the inflection, you're going to know that there's something else going on there. And so you want to make sure that you're giving them that space. Um, this is a very good, but obvious one. Don't tell the person to do it. Um, I've heard this actually, there's a comedian that like jokes about this um, from, an, from when she was a teenager and she felt suicidal that basically, you know, saying, well, then do it. Right. Sometimes we we say that this is like a cry for attention or to see if it's really something that they want to do. And it's almost like a test. And I'm going to be the first one to tell you that if, if your student or if you're feeling like somebody's doing, whether it's cutting, saying these things, anything like that for attention, that's still an unmet need. There's still something going on there that, yeah, they may need attention. They may need support. So we want to make sure that we're taking that serious. Um, and then the last thing, don't promise secrecy. So not everybody needs to know what's going on, but some key players need to know, right? So no, you don't need to go tell like aunts and uncles and cousins and friends and family and like tell everybody, but you do need to make sure that the right people are aware, right? So medical professionals, mental health professionals, maybe some key players at school, um, it, basically people that are gonna have an investment in making sure that your student is safe. And so this is something, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what we do in the district too in a little bit, but 
even in our offices, I mean, there's a reason why even with confidentiality, when students meet with us, that's the deal breaker right there, right? We don't promise secrecy either. So kids know when they come to us and they're having a conversation, when they share these things, we also can't keep that a secret. And so it's really wanting to make sure that we're establishing that so that kids know the right people and who to go to and then who's going to be aware of this. And so I would even have that conversation with them of like, hey, I don't want you to worry that I'm going to go tell the whole family, but I am going to make sure, you know, we're going to tell these certain people and get that buy-in from them. All right, go ahead, Lily. Well, I think we're going to open for questions now because yeah. um, we gave some examples. Um, do you guys have questions? I think, Amy, there were some put in here. Yeah. I saw there, the there are some on the queue. So if you want to go to your page with the questions, okay. do you have, or do you want me to read them? I can read them. Oh, you can read a couple. Why we yeah, go ahead. Read. Okay. Um, so Chris Tibbet um, asked, do you think support groups at the middle school and or high school level uh, would be helpful? And um, they added, I understand that clinical support slash therapists are important, but um, how about peer support groups organized by the district? Some kids feel so alone and are afraid to reach out for help. You want me to answer, Lily? Sure, and I can go after you. That's a great question. Um, and yeah, I think, so just to kind of give a little insight into what we do um, at the high school level, and I'll speak about the middle school in a minute. Um, we do typically when we're brick and mortar, when we're in person, we, we do run groups. Um, so every high school has a licensed clinical social worker and we all typically run groups with students. Um, and then at the middle school level, I believe, and I don't, I don't know if Jess or Donna, if you're there, if you want to chime in, I believe some of the counselors run groups. Um, and we also have social work interns that are there that typically, again, in a brick and mortar setting would be helping to support these groups as well. Um, as far as peer support groups, so we don't have anything like that. We do at the middle school and high school level have something called the Teen Suicide Awareness and Prevention Program, in which um, all of us are at the high school level are advisors for. And that's a peer ran program or club. So, and students basically go through a training in a way similar to this, where they're like learning about some of the warning signs and what to do if somebody like a friend or somebody they hear is suicidal, what to do with that information. And basically it's get them to a trusted adult. But running a peer group solely based for mental health would be a huge concern because the kids are not mental health professionals. They're not really equipped with the tools to know what to do. Um, but you'd be surprised at how much they open up with each other with us just there facilitating it. Lily, yeah. you want to add anything? Yeah, I think I would just add um, that actually at TV, we did have a peer support group. We actually had a whole class dedicated to it. It was called PLUS. Um, and they would actually pull students one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so they went through a little training. And then we did, so we did have that peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Um, it was very controlled, though. Like, you had to be referred to it. Um, and then I know that we, um, I know that they want to continue that. But yeah, right now it's hard online because um, there's not a teacher available to oversee all the peer-to-peer -peer interaction. So right now I know there's not any at TV, but there used to be, um, and we saw some success, but I think I would agree with Elise, it is concerning not having an adult there in case they share something really concerning, like having suicidal thoughts. Um, we don't wanna put that pressure um, and that burden on a student. Um, so, but I do think that's helpful, some peer-to-peer -peer interaction. And I think we get that from our groups too. Like I know a lot of my groups, they end up being friends and talking to each other after, so mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Any other? And just to chime in on the middle school, we do have some groups that are run by counselors at the middle school. Um, and we also, uh, but I don't think it's to the therapeutic level, obviously, that you guys are maybe doing in the groups that you have. But we also have our TSEP program at middle school. You mentioned these. And um, the TSEP program at middle school just started last year, and they've gotten really involved on campus. And I know that they've also worked with training the staff at the middle school as well, so that they're prepared to address some of the questions that can come up too. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, Amy, any others that we should? Yes. So Riza asked, how do you get males to engage in talking about feelings? Uh, I'm the only female in the house. Lily, you want to take a shot at that one? <laughs> sure. Um, I actually would say that my counseling groups with boys um, 
are actually the most talkative, like, and it's so surprising. <laughs> um, I think just creating like a safe um, space where they know they're like, okay, now I'm allowed to talk about my feelings um, and there's no judgment and everyone's involved. This has the same rule. Like you're not allowed to say, you know, anything negative. We can't talk about anything after this, you know, after this outside of the group. Um, my, my guy groups, like my boy groups are like so talkative. So um, I think asking like open-ended questions, um, asking questions about things that are not related to them, like that example that we gave earlier, um, what's, what are some reasons for living, right? Some like general questions I think are easier um, for someone who's uncomfortable asking about their feelings. So I don't know if that, that's helpful, but those general questions. And I would piggy off that and say, there's a really great YouTube video called um, The Mask You Live In. And it's actually just like a two or three minute trailer for a whole video or documentary. I haven't seen the whole one, but even that two to three minute one is super powerful. Um, it talks a lot about just the messages that boys and men hear growing up, right? Like, yeah. uh, don't cry, don't be a baby, um, act like a man, right? All these messages that they hear. And that's that's a cultural thing, right? So then if they heard those messages growing up in their family, or that's a big part, it's going to make it harder for them. Um, so I think again, like Lily said, it's just giving them that space. And actually I was just listening to a podcast on the way here about like, because oftentimes for boys, like they just say like, Oh, I just feel mad. Right. Like they don't know how to like expand on what they're feeling. Um, so really just helping them with like feeling identification, all these different things like, okay, I know you're saying you're mad, but like what feeling underneath that is there. And this is something that again, if it's, it's a big concern of yours that therapy could be really great for, um, but there's a lot of great resources out there and, and helping them basically connect to that. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> yeah, I think I would agree. Like using those educational videos that are online actually like really gets some kids talking that feel uncomfortable after they learn a little bit more about male expectations and, you know, society expectations that tends to be a good opener. Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions? There weren't any other in the queue, but maybe if somebody else wants to speak up, maybe unmute themselves or or put it directly in the chat to prefer. Okay. Well, we'll keep going and then at the end, we'll open it up again for questions too. And again, along the way, if you have questions, just pop it into the chat and we'll get to it. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is the, the, um, this is like a, the slide that we wanted to include that's like your go-to that has like all the things that you need to remember in like a, a situation that you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do again? Um, so we wanted to kind of create this little chart for you, um, an easy go-to slide. Um, but we do have a disclaimer. So I know we mentioned this before, but um, these situations evolve. So every situation with the student, um, we don't have like a cookie cutter answer for each student. Um, and every, everyone's so different. So um, when you look at that, we want you to consider that um, when you're referring to this. Just remember, like, this might not work for your student or this might not be the best option because um, we don't know what's going on. But this is just a general reference um, that you can go to. Um, and then if you are unsure, safety is always the priority. So if you, you know, if just err on the side of caution, that we would say, if you are viewing this chart. Um, so I'm going to go over the high risk, um, and then Elisa will, will do the other two. But um, high risk, so this is an example of a high risk student. It's very clear that the student um, needs support immediately. So the student has said yes to thoughts of suicide. The student has intent, right? So they express their desire and purpose to die um, and has indicated a plan, right? If they have all three of those, that puts them at a really high risk, and they need to be seen by a professional immediately. Um, sorry, that goes later um, and then um, has a um, had a previous attempts in the past so again um, that was a risk factor so if they've had previous attempts um, they really are at a high risk um, and then if they display warning signs um, that we've went over um, so if that is um, and you guys are experiencing this at home um, your parent or guardian needs to take the stu um, your student to see a professional immediately. So that would be the emergency room after school hours, um, actually after any hours, because therapists aren't open if you, are, if you do have a therapist, but most likely the best place to go is an emergency room. Um, again, we want to make sure that they get assessed by a professional um, because they might need to actually enter the hospital um, and go do treatment. Um, so uh, if they are really that high risk, you don't wanna take that chance. Um, if the student is refusing to go or you're scared that they're gonna run away, um, I know this sounds intense, but calling 911 is always an option. Um, so I've had some parents who have done that because they're like scared that they're gonna run away. 
Um, and then I, we just have a little disclaimer. Let's say you like do all of this, you ask all these questions, the student opens up, and then you finally get him to the emergency room and the professional, the doctor, or the psychiatrist does the assessment and then says you can go home. Um, this could happen and it sometimes feel like we get a lot of frustration from parents like, well, I did everything and we just went home anyways. So what was the point of that? Um, and I know, um, yeah, we've heard a lot of frustration in, in the past that's happened. So if that does happen, just know that that's, it, it could happen, but it's also the important thing is that you are getting assessed by a professional um, in case there is that immediate need to get them admitted. Um, and so um, sometimes it's a good thing that they went home because they don't need to be hospitalized, um, but just getting that initial is really important, um, that initial assessment with a professional. But also too, um, I know this is hard to hear for some parents, but sometimes students don't tell their parents everything. And it's hard to tell your parents everything, again, because you don't want to burden them, you don't want to scare them. So taking them to a professional to really get those deeper questions is crucial. Um, Okay, and then um, we put this on here, notify your student school counselor or school social worker. Um, this is definitely up to the parent. We don't want to like push that on you guys. I know some parents that don't want the school to know for like privacy reasons, um, but this is a, a really big benefit because then we can help support them in school. We can maybe meet with them. Um, we can have a team support them. So it really is important to notify the school if you feel comfortable with that. Yeah, yeah and I, before I jump into the moderate and low risk, I just want to like self-disclose a little bit because I've been in this situation. So even as a mental health professional who I do these threat assessments, I meet with these students, I ask these questions and feel pretty confident in doing it. There's been a situation in my life where when it was somebody close to me, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. Like I froze because it's personal. And so mm -hmm. I called a suicide hotline and basically just got like, what's the word I'm looking for? Not confirmation, but yeah, like you're doing the right thing, right? And so that's available to you. So, you know, even if like before you even have the conversation, if you're like, okay, I'm about to have this conversation, I'm really worried for where it might go. I, I just wanna make sure I'm doing the right thing. You can always call a hotline or crisis line and they'll help walk you through some of that too. So that's a great resource, not just for people that are experiencing the like ideation, but also for people trying to support somebody that may be suicidal. Yeah, and we're gonna give you those crisis lines. So at the end, you will have those phone numbers. Okay, so moderate risk. So this is kind of more in the middle, right? So your student maybe said yes to having thoughts in the past, but they're not suicidal right now. And I would say past, I would maybe put this like in the last, if it's past the last week, like you're probably good in some areas, but I would really also take into consideration, has this person been suicidal before? Have they had attempts before? Like you have to take all this in. Um, maybe they say yes to current suicidal thoughts, but they don't have any thoughts um, about how they're going to do that. No intent, no plans, no access to means, right? Um, and then they're displaying warning signs. So the response could be to call suicide crisis line together um, to schedule an urgent appointment with a mental health provider. There's also a 24 hour mental health urgent care that's in Paris. So it's a little bit far from us, but um, and we're going to provide that in the resources too. That's a great place that you can take them. That's not the emergency room. It's, and it's purely for mental health support. Um, and then you can notify your student's school counselor or social worker, just like Lily said. So it's not something that's required. It's just helpful for us to be able to help support your student, especially at school. Because we know that those thoughts don't stop when they like walk onto campus or start their online classes. And it may be affecting their education. So low uh, risk would be, um, oh, go ahead, Lily. Sorry, Lily. Someone asked if what is a 5150? Do you want to explain that really quickly? I feel like, oh, that's complicated. A 5150 essentially is a mental health hold, right? So it's basically somebody that makes the assessment saying this person cannot keep themselves safe. And so essentially they would get put on typically a 72 hour hold at a hospital. And the purpose of that, honestly, is just to keep them alive and safe. And then they continue to assess and see if they may need, may need continuous care. So you may have somebody that is suicidal and after the 72 hours is still suicidal and they may continue to have them placed on a hold um, or get them connected to aftercare. Do you want to piggy on any of that, Lily? Yeah, no, I would just say that, um, um, yeah, I think, I think the reason behind it is sometimes divulging that you might be suicidal for the first time might actually increase the likelihood of you going doing it because it's really scary, it's really intense. And so doctors can really gauge that and so they might keep you right then and there so you can't engage. And so that some of that fear and all that can kind of go down and you can get that immediate support. So that's all. And I just add. to like 
kind of picking on that too, only, only few people can actually 5150. So law enforcement yeah. and then at the hospital, there's typically, I believe Lily with that training we went to, it's like one person. Yeah, so it's, it's a psychiatrist. To do that. Yeah, it's a and designated then, person from the state. So because you're actually removing someone's rights. So to 5150 with someone, it has to be a very trained person. So it's an officer or a designated psychiatrist for like, and usually it's just one, right? For the whole hospital. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. And then low risk. Um, let's see. So they're, so your student, you ask them if they're having any of those thoughts, maybe they were displaying some of those warning signs, but they're denying that they're feeling suicidal. Um, so as long as like those warning signs are not the classic, like I'm having thoughts of dying or they're writing this somewhere where you're concerned that maybe they're lying to you um, or not being truthful because they're worried for whatever reason, then the response could be basically to continue to monitor them to see if any of those warning signs continue. Um, and you can assess to see if they need any mental health support. So you could ask them like, hey, do you, you know, I'm still a little bit worried about you. I know you said you're not having any thoughts of suicide but maybe you're still concerned that they might be experiencing some depression or another mental health challenge, and then you can help get them connected to supports, which we can talk about that in a little bit too. Um, and then again, consider notifying the school to basically fill us in so that we can help support. Okay, cool. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so this next part, we're gonna move into giving you guys like an actual scenario that you might experience. Um, and so we're just gonna kind of role, like kind of role play, kind of talk about like what we would say if we were in that situation. And again, it's just to kind of pull in all that information together. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's just an example. Um, so this first one will be geared more towards middle school and high school. And then we have another example after this for elementary. Um, okay, so yeah, I'll jump in. So the setting is, it's 10 p.m. and your student is blasting music from their room while everyone else is asleep. Um, so this is something out of the norm for maybe your home, but also for the student. This doesn't normally happen. Um, and also, aside from this incident, you've also noticed that over the last week, um, the student has said things like, what's the point? None of this matters. Nobody cares. I just make everyone mad. Um, right? So those are those hopelessness, like, hopelessness examples. Um, and also, um, Maybe they've been uh, behaving in a way that seems reckless. Um, maybe they're also sleeping a lot and having difficulty, um, difficult time waking up and engaging in their classes. So this is stuff that you've noticed. Um, so if we were there, honestly, if I hear the music blasting, I would go to the door and we would suggest maybe taking a quick moment to like do a little self-recognition, see if we're like annoyed or frustrated, right? Because they're breaking the rules. <laughs> um, so maybe just collect yourself, right? That's what we would do, just like a quick little collect yourselves and then remind us like, this could be a great opportunity to ask that tough question um, because it's just you two, everyone else is asleep um, and you know, they're doing something out of the norm. So you could really ask that question. That could be that opener question. Um, okay, so that's the first thing. Um, to start the conversation, we, we just use this example, maybe say something like, hey, let's turn off the music, what's going on? Um, so the what's going on part is pretty important because if we ask them why, like any question why, like why do you have the music going on? It could immediately put um, a student or anyone uh, defensive in a defensive mode, um, but also why questions um, most of the time get an excuse out of a person. Um, if you do something more like what's happening or what's going on, um, that can evoke the real answer. Um, so we just suggest that. And then as the conversation goes, you can say something like, I've noticed that you haven't been yourself. You seem like you're more down lately. You've also been talking in a way that makes me wonder if you're feeling hopeless. So right, you can use that time to share what hopeless means. Um, and then if you want to, you know, later in the conversation as it goes and you want to ask that question, this is an example of how you can lead into it. So sometimes when people are speaking that way, you may be thinking about suicide. I want you to know that I really care about you. And I know that we've never really talked about this kind of stuff before. You know, you could say like, oh, it might be a little weird, um, but are you having thoughts of wanting to die? So right, that's examples. Um, and you guys are gonna have a slide. You guys can make these your own. This is just an example. Okay, so let's say they do say yes, right? They respond with yes. They tell you a little bit about what's going on. Um, and we didn't write them all down because it, it would be a lot on here, but um, we kind of went over them before. We would respond in that empathy and care, right? So like, so sorry that you're feeling this way. Um, it must be really hard. Um, I, I can't believe that you've been going through this alone. I'm, you know, I really care about you and I'm here for you, right? So that's what's a, a typical response that I would say. Um, and then from there, I think I would try to gather a little bit more information. So say something like, um, 
you know, uh, is it okay if maybe ask a little bit more about those thoughts that you just mentioned that you're having? Um, have you ever thought about like how you would die? I know that's really personal, but it just would help me understand like where you're at and how, like what's going on. So have you ever thought about how? So I'd ask that question. Um, and again, I'm not reacting to their response. Sometimes you hear some really scary stuff, but just not react. <laughs> um, and then I would, you know, do that scale question. So um, again, this is just so that I understand like on a scale of one to 10, like one being like, no, I would never do that. I would never hurt myself. 10 being like, yeah, I do. I actually have a plan. I'm going to, like, it's going to happen. Like one to 10, where are you? And this is a really good tool. It sounds really like methodical, but we, I use it so often. I get some real um, great answers from that. Um, okay. And then I would just um, then lead into like my care again, like, well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. I know it must've been a little hard. You might feel a little like exposed. <laughs> um, but my main job right now is to keep you safe. And like, I want to make sure that I get you the help so that you don't actually die. Um, you mean so much to me. Um, so right now I want you to talk to a professional um, so that they can gauge it, they can talk to you um, and they can see what you need, right? So I would say something like that. Um, and uh, I do get a lot of emotion when I talk about maybe going to the hospital or going to see a professional. Um, I get a lot of pushback, uh, a lot of fear, a lot of anger. Um, and that's normal. That's expected. I mean, think about it. The first time they're talking about suicide with their parent, now they have to go to a doctor. Um, so it's expected. It's normal. I think the way that I handle it that diffuses the situation is just go back to showing them that like, you care. Like, I know that sounds scary. I know it's really intense, um, but I care about you. And that's more important is your safety right now. Um, and it's okay for mad at me that I'm making you do this, but I want to make sure you're okay. <laughs> right. So that's just like the type of language I would use. Um, and then um, uh, you can also give them an option here to like maybe call together. So this example, it's late at night, you can maybe call the crisis line together um, or take them to the emergency room um, if they are really experiencing those. Um, so yeah, that's the first example. Um, we'll have questions after the second example, um, time for questions. But Elise, would you add anything else? Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on like on the safety part and that sometimes Sometimes I experience this with students and I imagine it goes across the board with families too, right? So you get really worried about like rebuilding that trust, right? So for us, we have to break confidentiality for this, for when somebody, you know, reports anything about suspicion for child abuse or neglect. And it can be really hard because you're like, oh, I really want to like maintain this relationship and I don't want to break this trust with this person. But I actually see most times there's such a strong rebuild in the trust after that. Yeah. Um, and then it's very clear on what needs to happen. And what's so cool about this is you really open up that door for your student to be able to come to you to say, um, look, like I'm here to listen and you know exactly how I'm going to respond. You don't have to be scared about my response because you just saw how empathetic, how kind I was. Um, and the other part I wanted to piggy on is we talk, we're talking a lot about this assessment and we're, it's kind of isolated, right? So it's like a one-time thing. Assessment is ongoing. So like when Lily's talking about that scaling question, I often talk to parents who are constantly dealing with this with their kids, right? And I say, look, if you know that your students regularly have having like suicidal thoughts, suicidal ideation, a great way to scale them is that you guys have this like classic saying that you go to. So I usually say one to five, one to 10 um, on a scale of one to five, five being, you know, I'm suicidal and I'm having like thoughts of a plan, like kind of like that worst case scenario and one being like, no, I'm good. Like, Nope, no thoughts of suicide today. Um, you can ask your student, Johnny, where are you at in a one to five today? Mom, I'm at like a two. Okay, great. And you guys know that when Johnny's at a three, you know what you're going to do. You know when he's at a four, you know what you're going to do. You know when he's at a five. But you're not having to regularly have this conversation unless there's like a huge thing coming up that you're concerned. So that's a great way to like continue to gauge without feeling like you have to sit down and like use all this language every single time. I would only use this in those extremes. Another thing I meant to touch on the 5150 is that so often students worry about that, right? They don't speak up about suicidal thoughts. I even hear this from adults. They don't speak up about suicidal thoughts because they think that by having suicidal thoughts, you're going to get put on a 5150. And that's so inaccurate. In order to be, you're having, again, your rights taken away. So in order to be put on a hold, it has to reach a certain threshold. You have to be really unsafe to be able for that to happen. So if you're just having, especially like intrusive thoughts, you're like, oh my gosh, I keep having these thoughts of dying. 
I imagine myself like jumping in front of cars or whatever, but you have no intent, you have no plan to do it. We're just gonna get you help. We're not gonna wanna 5150 you. But the concern sometimes is that those thoughts can get to that point. So we really wanna intervene here, right? Rather than here, rather than when they get to that five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead and the next one. Okay. So again, we wanted to kind of provide an example for more of like an elementary, and I've seen this happen in middle school and high school too, but um, I think that there's a lot of the times people feel like elementary students don't struggle with these thoughts. And, you know, the reality is that they do. Um, we see, you know, we work with school social workers who are at the elementary level and they're doing these assessments too. So here's the setting. So it's five o'clock, you're eating dinner, and your student says that they're really worried about a friend who posted on their Instagram. So imagining like a fourth, fifth, sixth grader um, that they don't wanna be here anymore. So your student tries to direct message them and their friend just responds by, right? So there's no context, they don't know, um, but your friend knows like this is something I'm concerned about, so they come to you. So the sign, so you know that the family's experiencing a lot of change right now, including financial struggles. Um, one of the parents lost their job due to COVID um, the parents might be separating, so there's a lot of like arguments and stuff going on in the home. And you know that the student has shared with their older si that their older sibling has been drinking a lot, right? So these are a lot of risk factors that we've talked about. They're not warning signs; they're risk factors, right? We don't we don't know where they're at. So the response would be, if this is not your student, right? This is someone else's child. If you have that parent's contact information, call them right away. And so what you don't want to do is like it's probably fine. They didn't answer. Or I shot them a text but I haven't heard back from them. I would say if you don't hear something back within like 10, 15 minutes, I know it can sound extreme like Lily said, but just call law enforcement, ask for them to go out and do a welfare check. Um, you'd rather have somebody mad or frustrated or upset or inconvenienced than somebody that could possibly be suicidal and may have made an attempt or anything like that, right? So we're often looking back on these situations and how traumatic they are and wishing there's something we could have done. Um, and this is one of those times. So you just always wanna err on the side of caution. Um, and the law and law enforcement, just so you guys know, typically when they go out, I, I believe when they're getting these mental health calls, they're bringing somebody out that's either a clinician or we have what's called like the crest team and somebody that's a mental health provider professional to be able to do this assessment. Um, so yeah, yeah. So really just erring on that side of caution. Yeah, I think I would just add to uh, a welfare check is just like a term that police yeah. officers use. Um, it's okay. Um, to um, just say that they're going to go check on the family. So they're not going to accuse, they're not going to arrest anyone. Like it's not this extreme like situation where the police is knocking the door. They're just checking on the family and seeing what's going on. So that's a welfare check. I don't know the like the legal term, but that's just what we know for it to be. Thank you. Yeah. So we only have a few more slides after this. Um, so thank you guys for bearing with us. Does anybody have any questions at this point? I had a comment, Elise. Um, yeah. I just wanted to get your take on this. Um, first of all, um, some of these uh, households, you know, you got to figure that if a, if, a, if a young person is considering suicide, that there's a very good chance that they don't have a good relationship in that household or, or that it's just not, it's not a strong enough uh, relationship with, it could be, you know, with the parents, the siblings. It's just, if they if they if they had really strong relationships, that might you know they might not even be considering suicide. So I'm just saying that I think this school and you guys are doing a phenomenal job. Uh, you guys are doing all these interventions on a weekly basis. Um, you're, you you have videos and everything. And I know that like last year, like this year already, I have three students that I'm very concerned about that would benefit significantly from uh, uh, intervention. And, uh, and last year I had, had several too. And, and, you know, I've talked with uh, Lily cause I'm at TVHS and uh, you know, it, it, it's overwhelming for you guys. You can't pick up everybody. And that's one of the reasons you guys do like group meetings with students. Cause it's, it's one of the only ways you can do it. What I, what I was thinking is do you, I mean, cause you guys have to talk to your colleagues in the field what, what are you guys discussing? I mean, because obviously we need more uh, adult help with these issues. And I'm just wondering, I mean, like maybe Medi-Cal, for example. I know in special ed, Medi-Cal does some stuff and, and pays for some special ed services and stuff. Is, is Medi-Cal maybe available? I mean, can we bust these kids to, or maybe just do uh, like, like what we've been doing with these Google, with the Zoom meetings with like uh, professionals? 
Um, I mean, what can we do to get them with, you know, either do we train our teachers, some of our teachers so that they're prepared to handle this and can, can meet with a student on a weekly basis or every other week basis that if we're concerned about them, do we bus them over to, you know, uh, mental health professionals through Medi-Cal maybe paying for it? I mean, what, what, are, what are your colleagues talking about? Because honestly, the idea that someone who's really committed suicide and it's that bad, that they're gonna, that there must be some serious dysfunction in that household in a lot of those cases. And so the strategies we're talking about are I think better handled by the adults at the school or, or through the mental health professional community. What, what are your thoughts on that? I'm just wondering. What... So I, I first wanna say too that I totally hear your concern that like this is often the student, right? Where family's a mess. And while that sometimes is something going on where they're, like you said, there's you know, trauma, there's abuse, there's neglect, there's some sense of um, like what you I think called dysfunction in the family. That's sometimes, but sometimes it's not, right? So we know that people that experience depression, that experiences the mental health challenges, this could be hereditary, there could be a host of things that this is coming from. And so I've had probably equally as amount, the amount of kids with stuff going on at home that don't have things going on at home, that do have good relationships, that still have these thoughts. Um, and oftentimes the difference is, again, in that communication about the thoughts, right? So if you have that strong relationship, the hope is that the student is then communicating it. Um, as far as schools goes, that's actually like something that we're really trying to do right now. Like we have Mental Health Mondays, like you mentioned, like we're trying to push yeah. out videos. It's building those relationships, right? So we know that by having a stronger sense of connection to your family, to your peers, to your school, it's a cultural thing, right? Like there's one of us and 3,000 kids at our sites. And mm -hmm. so how do we support all of these kids? And you kind of touched on it. It's, it's everybody has a role in this. So just like, you know, like when a kid comes in my office, like sometimes it's helping them get organized on how to set goals that help them with their academics, right? And so every teacher just by fostering that connection is supporting kids with their mental health. And so it's really like a team effort. Um, Lily, do you wanna add? Yeah, I think I would just um, add on that first part, um, not having a good connection with a family member is actually a risk factor, right? So we talked about those risk factors. So let's say that's one, but then, um, and their strong relationship with their family, but then they have all these other risk factors and all these other um, um, uh, warning signs. That would put them at that high risk, even though they have like a good relationship with the parent. Does that make sense? So I think I would agree. I see half and half. Like I see, some students that have great relationship with their parents, um, but they just don't know how to deal with all the other stuff, like not getting along with peers and feeling isolated and having that relationship break up, you know, um, getting bullied, right? So a lot, it, it's, a, it's a combination of things. But I do see um, if there is, you know, a struggle with parents, it does make it harder on the student. So I would agree, but I also see the, the other opposite too. Um, and then, yeah, I think I would just, you know, that's our, that's our conversation all the time. Like, how do we reach all these students? Um, so we're hoping um, that next year we can continue, or when we're in person, to continue the Mental Health Mondays to so kind of make it more of an everyday thing where we're talking about mental health. Uh, just opening up the conversation with teachers could uh, make them feel comfortable to reach more, you know, to, to open up. Um, and then also when we can't handle it, it's too much. We actually partner with a company that connects them to a therapist. Um, it's called Carisolis. So the district actually pays for it. Um, and um, it's a great resource. So um, I think they look at Med Medi-Cal actually too. Um, so they actually help out with their insurance. They figure out with the family. They do kind of that grunt work of how to get them help through um, with money, right? With insurances and stuff. So we do have that. Uh, not everyone has access to it, but we do. Um, so that's one cool thing that we've, um, we've had and we feel less overwhelmed. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is, a, it is a tough one. And like, believe me, we wish that there was more of us too. Um, yeah. I think everybody, and this is again, where it, I think it comes a lot down to funding, right? Yeah. So when those LCAP surveys come out, this is the stuff that we just encourage people to, to make yeah. sure that they're discussing what their concerns are so that we can get yeah. more supports. Yeah. If I may just jump in there real quick too and add to that. Um, Louis is exactly right on the Carousolis portion. The Carousolis is a company that we've partnered with and we're going into our second year now that parents, staff, um, like anyone can reach out to them and receive supports for their family. So if you have a child that you think needs counseling, contact Carousolis. They will work with you. They're very good about placing kids, I would say, I don't want to say immediately, but they are very quick in placing kids. And if you don't have insurance, they will work with you. They, they really um, try hard to get the kids placed quickly and get them placed with a reputable 
uh, program or agency so that they can get the support they need. So if you have questions for us on that, yes, thanks Lee, um, for posting that. It is on our website. You guys can see carousels on there. Also, um, in terms of social emotional needs, that is a board priority right now for Temecula Valley Unified School District. And we've put a big emphasis on that this year. So please know that our school board recognizes the importance of it because the district are recognizing it and we're doing what we can to support the social emotional needs of all our families. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jess, for clarifying. Yeah, I think last year, not a lot of people have access, but now everyone has access now to Care Solis. So thank you for clarifying. <laughs> yeah. And then we got a question, Lily. So it says, uh -huh. speaking of hereditary and possible chemical imbalances in the brain, how do you know when medication for depression and or anxiety may be warranted? I know it's a tough question, but any insights appreciated. It's a such a tough call for a parent because none of us want to medicate our children and use drugs to alter their brain chemistry. Yeah, that's definitely a tough question. Um, we actually don't prescribe medication and we actually don't diagnose either. Um, that's um, not at the scope of our practice. So um, that we would have to say, talk to a doctor and they can give you specifics. That's what I would say. I don't know, Elise, if you want to add. No, I would say the same thing. Like I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't know enough about yeah. medication. I will say generically, like it works for some, not for others, um, but it's definitely a conversation to have with the psychiatrist and um, yeah. express your concerns. Cause I, I don't think I've met one person that hasn't had that concern. Yeah. And I think, yeah, and something that I've seen a lot is medication is always a trial and error. Like you just have to keep trying at it, like keep working with the doctors to find like the right one or the right dose. So that's the only thing that I've seen. Uh, it's not, it's not a quick answer. So yeah. Um, All right. So let's go ahead and go to the next one. Yep. Perfect. So we kind of touched on that a little bit already, but um, we just wanted to go over um, how our district handles um, a safety concern or threat assessment concern. We call them threat assessment protocol. So that's like our protocol to respond to a threat. Um, so uh, a lot of times we actually get referrals um, from teachers. So like Mr. Alexander mentioned, um, we've talked before, but he sends students that he's concerned about. He's noticed their behavior. He's noticed those warning signs, or maybe they wrote something. Maybe they um, shared something in class. So that sometimes we get students that way. Um, we also get students from like uh, students that are concerned about friends. Again, maybe they saw something or said something or posted something. So we get a lot of peer-to-peer um, -peer concern. And then even sometimes we get par parent concern, they call the school. Um, and so that's how we get referrals sent to us to do these threat assessments. So um, when we have a suicide concern, we actually do these assessments. So that, that uh, in-depth in uh, assessment that's done by a professional, that, that's what we do. Um, the social workers on campus, psychologists are trained also on campus and counselors and admin. Um, so we kind of work as a team to do it. Um, yeah, so we, we assess them and then we there then we partner with whatever we need to do to get them the support. So if it is at high risk, we would actually partner with the school officer on campus um, and then from there get them to whatever they need. Um, and then we definitely um, let admin know and then we talk to parents. Um, and then after kind of that initial assessment, we always provide that support after the student comes back to school. Um, sometimes it's a team meeting, sometimes it's that safety plan that Elisa's talking about that we create together and give to everyone. Um, and then sometimes it's one-on-one -on -one, uh, sessions um, or getting into a group. So um, that's kind of how we deal with it generally on campus. And I would just piggy on that and say, like, just so you guys kind of have an idea, let's say for example, um, a teacher in their sixth period or at the very end of the day learns about this from about a student and the student's already gone. So at that point, we don't have access to the student anymore either. They're not there. And right, this is, we're talking very a brick and mortar situation right now. Um, then at that point, we would call for law enforcement to do a welfare check, which Lily explained earlier is essentially just for them to go out and check. And then they would be doing that assessment to see what needs to happen from there. Um, and then as far as when we're virtual, it's, it's a little bit different circumstances right now. Um, we're, we're a lot less of a crisis resource right now than we typically are. Um, so let's say if somebody has that concern, like we get a call from a teacher that's like, hey, a kid in my class just said they're suicidal. Well, we're not there, right, to keep them physically safe. So we would just call law enforcement out right away to go and check that situation. Um, again, yeah. we can't keep them safe at that point. Yeah, we don't have a lot of options right now. And the other thing I was going to touch on, and I know I already mentioned this, um, but at the high school and the middle school level, we have the Teen Suicide Awareness and Prevention Program, which is we partner with Riverside University Health System. And basically, it's a student-run program, club, whatever you want to call it. 
and we're the advisors for it. And the students work on like different campaigns and basically like get trained to some degree on what to do with this information. And again, the whole purpose of this is when they learn that somebody may be struggling with these suicidal thoughts um, is to get them to a safe adult. So everything kind of comes back to safe adult. Um, so it's really just trying to give them some of the tools that they need because we're not always going to be there. And sometimes students open up to each other. And so it's a really great resource for them to know and, and not feel like they have to carry this, I don't want to say burden, but this like heavy load on their shoulders of like carrying the responsibility of somebody told me that they're having thoughts of wanting to die and feeling like they have to keep that a secret. So it's learning that it's okay to like break that and, and understanding that I just say this very blatantly to them, you'd rather have a mad friend than a dead friend, right? So we really just want to make sure that students are safe. And so that's what we're doing with the, the suicide prevention program. Yeah, and we're, we're attempting to do it online right now. Like we've created clubs and we've been trying to recruit people and we meet with them virtually. So we're still trying this year, even though it's tougher. So um, yeah, next slide, are we good to go? Uh -huh. okay. So we I just- one more actually, sorry. Oh, go ahead. There was an anonymous um, question. Um, I have a child in an elementary school who has said that they wish they weren't alive a few times. It's only happened after a large meltdown or after being placed in a timeout. Is this something to be concerned about? I couldn't really hear the question. Yeah, you can you say it one more time? Sorry. Sorry, okay. I said, um, so it is, I have a child in an elementary school who has said that they wish they weren't alive at this time. This has only happened after a large meltdown um, or after specifically being placed in a timeout. Is this something to be concerned about? So I would initially say that I would look into it a little bit more, right? We always want to err on the side of caution. So I would have them speak to a professional just to make sure um, to find that intent, right? Sometimes it's hard to figure things out with a child, if, like what the intent is, but um, I would take that seriously. Um, I always say it's, it's better to, to take it seriously because one, um, they immediately see you react and they feel supported, but two, it teaches them not to say that if that's really not what they're feeling because you're going to react. You're going to get them some support. You're going to get them to talk to someone. So that's what I would say. I don't know, Elise, what would you? Yeah, I would say like if that was happening, once they're not in this like meltdown, yeah. like I have a almost four-year-old, so I know when he's like losing it, there's no, right there, that part of their brain is like so off right now. They can't yeah. communicate, they're just expressing. So when they're calm, you know, I would go back to that and say like, hey, I, I heard you, I wanna make sure I'm reading it right. I heard you say that you wish you weren't alive. Like, what, what do you mean by that? What does that mean to you? Yeah. Um, and really try to like hear what that means. So I'm just gonna give the example that like right now, you know, with COVID and everything, death has come up a lot. So my son talks a lot about people dying and, but it's, I can understand the context of it. And so I would just try to gauge like, where is that coming from first? Um, and either way, whether it's an emergency or not, I would say that warrants them probably talking to somebody to figure out more of what might be going on. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. So not to freak you out, but um, I would take it seriously. Yeah. And go talk to someone. Um, okay. Yeah, and just for anybody else, if you have any other anonymous questions that are not, um, that are about the presentation, you can message Amy directly. Is that what happened, Amy? They sent it. Okay. So feel free to do that if you're more comfortable and don't want to put it out in the chat. So for, for those who don't know in the chat, there's a little in the two box, you can change the arrow to everyone from everyone to a specific person. And you can just change it to myself if you'd rather remain anonymous. Thank you. Okay. So up on the slide, we have resources that we've listed out for you. Um, so we've got, again, we've kind of explained that TVSC has site support. So the elementary, um, every elementary school has a site social worker or counselor to help support you. That's a part of our social emotional learning team. The middle school and high school all has um, a counselor or school social worker. But if you're in need of support for your student, you're gonna wanna reach out to, if it's a middle school or high school, reach out to the counselor first. So again, because there's like 3,000 kids at all of our sites and only one of us, we try to funnel th things through the counselor first. Um, they have smaller caseloads so that they can help distribute um, certain referrals to us and know what supports need to come into play. And then the next thing we have listed is Care Solace, which has been mentioned. So there's a link right there for you. And I wanna touch on this because you, there's two options here. So let's say you go to that website, you can actually access some of this yourself. And essentially what they do is cut out the middle, like the middleman work. So a lot of the times, like you're picking up the phone, you're trying to find a provider, who covers your insurance, who has availability, Care Solace really helps to cut out that because they recognize that this is a huge barrier for families in getting that support. 
And so they'll help do this for you. Um, but the other thing you can do is if you have a relationship with um, a teacher or um, a school counselor or us, you can always reach out again to those same people to say like, hey, I need to get connected to support. Um, and then we can do what's called a warm handoff. So basically it cuts out you having to go to that website and do these drop downs and enter some of this and it just connects you directly. Um, and this is for not just your student, this could be for you or anybody in your family. Um, so it's really accessible to anybody or staff for yourself as well. The next thing we have listed is the 24 seven mental health urgent care that we mentioned. Um, again, this is in Paris, uh, but this is 24 seven and a great resource. Yeah, we've heard really good things about people that have actually went there. So it's worth the drive. Definitely. And then the My3 safety planning app. I put the website there, um, but it's an app, but they, they also have a website. Again, I can't recommend this enough. It's basically like, actually, let me see. I might have it on my phone so I can show you guys. Nope, I don't. Um, but basically it opens up, like after you fill out the safety plan that we've talked about, when you first open up the app, it has like three different bubbles and it has the person's name with their number connected. So you just click it and then it allows you to call, and these are people in their safety network, right? People they feel safe with, people they wanna communicate with um, to maybe express like what's going on or how they're feeling. And then it has the crisis hotline, same thing that you can click. And then it just has, I believe 911 that you can click as well. Yeah. So then in addition to that, we just listed some crisis support lines and hotlines. Um, so we have the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, the California Youth Crisis Line, and the Trevor Project, which is spe specific to our LGBTQ plus community, um, the Transgender Suicide Hotline, and then the Crisis Text Line. Um, so all of these different hotlines, crisis lines can help support some of these situations as well. And for most, I don't know if all of these are, but most of these are on the back of your student's ID card. I believe, ooh, Jess or Donna, could you chime in middle school and up? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and so right now when Lily's gonna go to the next slide and talk, I'm gonna put some links into the chat for you that include all of these slides um, and then a different document that has just warning signs, protective factors and risk factors. And then I'm gonna let Lily take over. Yeah, so this is just our, the ending of our presentation. So um, we thought it would be great to end with this video. Um, this video is, um, is a man who actually um, experienced suicidal thoughts enough to attempt when he was in high school, um, I think a teen, yeah. So he talks about his story um, and it is a little um, emotional and intense, but it's such a great video. Um, so we're gonna watch it, but before we do, we thought maybe um, you guys can write some more questions, maybe during the video, you guys can put it in the chat. Um, and we'll be, we'll just be here monitoring the chat while we'll watch, while we're watching the video. Um, and then we're also going to include an evaluation form, um, in the chat. So if you can't stay and watch the video, um, uh, then, uh, you can just fill that out. Um, but we'll be back after the video, um, and answer some questions. I think the video is about nine minutes, so it's, it's long, but it's good. And then we'll come back, um, and answer those last questions. Um, anything else, Elise? Nope. Okay. Okay, let's see if it works this time. <laughs> Let me push. At the age of 17, I developed bipolar disorder, a very severe form. It nearly uh, cost me my life and nearly destroyed my family. My parents were in the middle of getting divorced at the time. Uh, it was a tumultuous time for my life as a teen. And I believed uh, that I was the only one under that cloud. But that's, that's so far from the truth, so far from the fact. 50 million people around the world diagnosed mentally ill. Uh, so many more undiagnosed, but that had the diseases that are in their brains. I don't want to have this disease. I don't want to be flawed. Bipolar disorder, that's not me. I was a wrestling champion in the WCL League in, 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 in California. There's no way. My football team went to state, this is garbage. And I, I was in so much denial. And that denial ruled the day until I crashed hard. And it was September 24th when, when it all came to a head. I sat at my desk and I penned that note. Mom, dad, brother, sister, girlfriend, best friend. Love you, but I gotta go. I was gonna go to the Golden Gate and I was gonna disappear. I thought I was my family's burden. I wish I asked them. I just wanted the pain to stop. That's the common denominator of people we lose to suicide. They just want the pain to stop. What they don't realize 
is that their thoughts don't have to become their actions. Their thoughts don't have to take over. If you can recognize those thoughts as flawed and illogical, because suicide is an irrational state of mind. You think you have to die, but you don't really want to. You know, I found myself in my father's room that morning. I startled him awake. He looked at me, said, Kev, what's wrong? Like with parental instinct. I said, uh, nothing, dad. I just want to tell you that I love you. It's for the very last time. And, you know, he goes, I love you too, Kev. But it's six in the morning and I don't got to be working until nine. Go back to bed. I walked around to the other side of the bed. I sat on the carpeted floor and I rocked myself back and forth in tears, begging myself to tell the one man who loves me the most in the world the truth. But the voice in my head said, be quiet, Kevin, you have to die. And that's what took me to the Golden Gate that morning. I took a bus there. And on that bus, all I wanted to do was scream and beg for help and live. But the voice became so loud. I sat on that bus in the back row, middle seat. I'm crying my eyes out like a baby, mucus dripping from my nose. People staring at me now. Then I'm yelling aloud at the voices in my head. I desperately wanted someone to say, are you okay? I would have told them everything. Fear, apathy. There was a guy to my left, said to the fellow next to him, while pointing at me with his thumb, what the hell's wrong with that kid with a smile on his face? Apathy, that's his or her problem, but it ain't mine. The bus got to the bridge, I sat there crying. Bus driver turned, he stood, he looked at me and he said, kid, come on, get off the bus, I gotta go. I walked across the walkway of the Golden Gate Bridge for 40 minutes, up and down, back and forth, crying like a baby. Bikers, joggers, tourists, runners, they all went by me. Police officers searching for suicidal people went by me twice. I'm leaning over the rail, crying like a baby. They went by me twice. Nobody cares. And the voice in my head said, jump now, and I did. At the millisecond that my hands left that rail, instant regret for my actions and the absolute recognition that I just made the greatest mistake of my life. You know, falling head first, right in my body, accidentally, landed in a position that wouldn't kill me. On the way down, I said to myself, what have I just done? I don't want to die. God, please save me. And I hit the water. I went down 70 feet beneath the water's surface, but I opened my eyes. My legs, I couldn't move. I had shattered my T12, L1, and L2 lower vertebrae into shards like glass. I had missed severing my spinal cord by uh, two millimeters. I swam to the surface only using my arms. When I came to the surface, bobbing up and down in water, sw swallowing salt water, kept going down, couldn't stay afloat. A woman driving by in a red car saw me go over and she called her friend in the Coast Guard. The reason the Coast Guard got to my body within less than the time I was set in hypothermia and drowned was because of that woman making that phone call. The Coast Guard arrived. They fished me out of the water they put me in a flatboard. They put a neck brace around my neck. And they started asking me a bunch of questions. Guy looks at me. He leans in. And he says, kid, do you know how many people we pull out of this water that are already gone? And I said, no, and I don't want to know. And he said, well, I'm going to tell you. This unit has pulled 57 dead bodies out of this water. And one live one. I looked up at my dad and I said, Dad, I'm sorry. And he looked down at me and with great conviction, he said, no, Kevin, I'm sorry. And waterfalls flew from his eyes. He put his hand on my forehead and he said words I've never forgotten. Kevin, you are going to be okay, I promise. And that got me through the night. Now I had this opportunity to recover. And a lot of people think that I went from this incident and was like, oh, I'm so much better now. You know, oh great, it's all gone. No, this was just the beginning. In the first three psych ward stays, involuntary, forced in against my will. But those next four, I found self-awareness. I found the ability to say, I'm gonna accept that I have this disease. 
I'm going to fight it tooth and nail. I'm going to beat it one day at a time. And that's what I've been doing. Exercising every day, eating healthy most days, educating myself about bipolar disorder, being able to utilize all of those things, work them into a regimen, a routine that helps keep me here. The common denominator of recovery from mental illness is routine. There are so many things we can do that are not clinically based for all the people that don't get clinical care. If you can train your body and your mind to wake up at the same time, Go to bed at the same time. Take your pills at the same time if you're on medication, which helps some people and not all. Train your body and mind to eat at the same time, roughly within a two-hour period every day. Work out even as simple as 23 minutes a day. That leads to 12 hours of better mood. Your eight-second hugs wherever you can. Eight-second hugs release endorphins in the brain that make you feel better. I thought that I had one chance, one choice, and one burden to take care of. I had to die, and I was wrong. Learn from me. Know that your thoughts don't have to become your actions. You were not meant for this world to leave it by way of suicide too soon. But one thing you can never do, one thing you should never do is silence your pain. I silenced my pain for years. I buried it deep down inside me like so many people do. And I lost myself. And it came out in a burst of rage against myself that led me to attempt to take my life. I want you to learn from me. Suicide is not the answer, and you deserve to be here for you. But your pain is valid, your pain is real, and your pain matters because you do. No matter what you think about how you aren't valued or you're worthless, it's not the truth. You have to find a way to turn back to logic. Logic says that I do get to live, you matter, you're beautiful. We need you. Please be here tomorrow. I just want to piggy on something before you guys start to leave too, that this is, I mean, his story is so powerful, but if you are feeling like, wow, I need to have this conversation with my student, you just use the fact that you just came to this training, this presentation as like you're in, Hey, I just went to this presentation on suicide. Like, I don't, I'm just curious. Like, have you ever had those thoughts before? Um, it might be a really great way just to, to very casually kind of come across that if you're feeling like a loss of words. Or even watching this video together. If it's like a high school student, I think that could be really powerful. I love the part where he talks about, um, uh, that he wished he would have had someone ask him like how this is so appropriate to what we talked about, right? They, a lot of times people who are struggling with suicide want to talk about it. Um, and they're, and they, they, um, you know, they're crying for help, right? Like he showed a lot of warning signs. So I love that he mentioned that. And then I also love the part where he talked about, um, uh, his dad just saying that he like he's going to be okay just having that verbal reassurance from his parent like is what got him through the night like that's huge right and so it might not seem like you're doing a lot but you being there and validating them and right using those empathy words is so powerful so I don't know I think that's like my favorite part <laughs> and I, I agree Lily I, and yeah. I love to just again I think it hindsight's twenty twenty, right so this poor dad looking back at that conversation he was having with him that morning um, but also like the way that he even describes it, I'm like, was, did, did dad maybe miss something looking back? Did he yeah. say, oh, I heard something in his voice. Like, why is he randomly coming in my room at six in the morning to tell me that he loves me? If yeah. that's not a common thing, that's a warning sign. That's a concern. Yeah. And that's something to be like, what's going on. Right. And, and just trying to get curious about it. Um, trust your yeah. gut and always, always, always err on the side of caution. Yep. So yeah. Does anyone are there have any questions? Yeah, or any comments or? I wanted to add too, I, like I've, I've heard several of his stories like through other, like if you look up this guy, like his story is like all over the place because he's such a huge advocate for like suicide prevention, suicide awareness. Yeah. Um, and one thing that he's mentioned, not in this video, but in several others that he's in or he's made is like that the moment that his hands left the, 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 the thing on the on the bridge it was instant regret and that he's he's spoken to at least 19 other survivors who've had the same immediate response of the moment that their hands left that rail instant regret and the whole way down just thinking I don't want to die you know and that just like adds to like the earlier thing that um 
you know, our presenters were speaking to how sometimes these, um, these intrusive thoughts or these, um, these feelings that they have, you know, it's, a, it's sometimes just a matter of access and sometimes it's just a matter of impulse and not fully like thinking it through. Um, so yeah. just asking those questions and making sure that we're not afraid to have those, these com com kinds of conversations. So yeah. important. I think that's so good. That's so powerful. Yeah. And a different video I watched too, like they were the only 19 survivors, like the only ones that have ever survived jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge and all of them said the same thing. Um, and so that's pretty powerful. Like that tells you a lot of, um, you know, what's going through someone's head um, if they are attempting. And oftentimes we hear, and I think he said this too, it's not that I want to die. I just don't want to feel this way anymore. And so this is like their final out. And yeah. we just need people to understand that there's help, right? Like, and that you're not going to feel like this forever and that we can get you to those supports and help so that you're not feeling this way all the time. Right. And it's, yeah, and it's such a misconception, like, okay, you're going to go to therapy and you're never going to feel this way again. You're never going to struggle with this. That's not the case. But like he said, even though he was hospitalized seven more times after this, yeah. four of them involuntary or three of them involuntary after that. And then the next four voluntary, because he started to learn those skills and recognize Hey, I still struggle with the same things, but now I know when I need to get myself the support that we need, that I need. So, well, anyways, I just, I think for Lily and I both, and Lily, you can speak up, but we just appreciate those of you that came and sat with us for the last two hours yeah. um, and does talk. So thank you. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And I would just remind you to click on the links that we put in the chat, like um, the presentation so that you can have, because once we end this, you will not have that chat option anymore. So just click on all the links before you exit um, so that the you can evaluation form pretty please yeah that valuation form and then the slides um yeah we really yeah, would appreciate it yeah elise lily and amy thank you so much and i you know i'm watching this and you guys did such a fantastic job tonight the comments are coming through you guys see that and thank you for all you do and i feel like we're so fortunate to have all of you here supporting our students and tonight supporting our families fantastic presentation thank you very much and thank you everyone who came out tonight to listen to this Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And Stephanie too. Stephanie Fullman, our, our yeah.